It was actually over a year ago that we started our series in the book of Acts. And I think I made a remark at the beginning of that series about how I didn't want it to turn into one of those situations where, you know, we're in one part of Acts one year and then the next same time next year we're like three chapters in further into Acts. And that wasn't the situation, but it did take us over a year, and we took a couple breaks here and there. This, this morning we are at the end of an era. Paul finally makes it to Rome in Acts chapter 28. And this will be the last lesson in our Acts series. I hope that it has been as beneficial for you as it has been for me to study the book and to um, look at the text some more and to look at what God has had to say to us. I, I have always been and continue to be a strong believer that the most effective kind of teaching there is is teaching that comes directly from the text of the Bible itself. And while I know there are you know, varying differences of opinion about how much one should do topical versus textual versus expository and whatnot, there is, of course, I think, something to be said for a healthy balance of the scriptures in our teaching. And I hope that if it is not my teaching that has benefited you, but rather that it is the Word of God that has been a benefit to you throughout. And that even though I may be inadequate as a messenger, or as a, uh, a vessel of truth, a conduit for the Word of the Lord, it is the Word of the Lord that is truly the most adequate thing, the thing that is able to equip us and strengthen us and make us thoroughly equipped for every good work, as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 17. In Acts chapter 28, we're in the midst of a narrative about Paul's journey to Rome. Paul has chosen to travel by boat, and uh, things were smooth sailing, no pun intended, in verses 1 through 13. And then in verses 14 through 44, they had a shipwreck. A great storm showed up, which drove them off course and forced them to abandon a substantial portion of their cargo and dump it overboard. Um, they eventually wound up losing the ship when they ran aground on an island and had to swim to shore. The island, of course, is Malta, which we will read about in chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. And from Malta, Paul will make the final journey to Rome in verses 11 through 23. I don't know why I still have 13 up there. I was supposed to correct that when I saw that mistake last week. Um, no, no, wait, that's not what went wrong. I should have written 31. 31 is the end of the book. And this is an example of preacher dyslexia. Uh, so here we have um, Paul's final journey to Rome. And Paul comes to Rome. To kind of review the route he's taken, he started out all the way over here in Caesarea. And then he traveled to Sidon, to Myra, and uh, after a little bit of skirting around and fighting hostile winds, they arrive at Fair Havens in Crete. And now... They could have stayed in Fair Havens and wintered there, but it wasn't a very good harbor. And so they talked about, well, let's try to go a little bit further westward and settle in and harp winter in Phoenix. Phoenix was even further west on the island of Crete. Unfortunately, you'll notice from this route that they didn't even come close to getting that mark because the winds drove them off course and they wound up in a storm, almost drove them into that gulf on the coast of Libya, before finally running aground at the island of Malta. Now, here's a picture of Malta. This is actually uh, St. Paul's Island off the coast of Malta. And uh, this was taken in the modern day, which is why there's a statue of Paul right there in the picture. Uh, they hadn't built that when Paul was there for some reason. Uh, but, uh, now, but Paul, uh, this is of course the location where Paul is traditionally thought to have run aground. And... Uh, you know, that's whether or not that's the case, I don't know, but I'm sure lots of tourists, well, the tourist industry is booming because of it. But while he is at Malta, let's begin reading in verse 1. While they, when, they had brought safely, when they had been brought safely through, and we found out that the island was called Malta. The natives showed us extraordinary kindness, for because of the rain that had set in, and because of the cold, they kindled a fire and received us all. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. And when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began saying to one another, Undoubtedly, this man is a murderer. And though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. However, he shook the creature off and into the fire and suffered no harm. They were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had waited a long time and had seen nothing, 
unusual happened to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. Uh, so, first thing that happens to him when he gets to Malta is he gets bitten by a snake. Uh, and the first thing they really dis they discover it's called Malta. The native inhabitants receive them kindly, light a fire for them. They need a fire to warm themselves in light of the fact that they've just gone through a bunch of cold winter rains. And while Paul is helping tend the fire, he gets bitten by a snake. Paul just can't seem to catch a break in this story. I mean, first he gets arrested and in prison for two years. And then he gets shipwrecked and nearly dies. And then, when he finally gets to land, a snake bites him. Uh, you know, there's a, in Amos chapter 5, and verses 18 through 20, there's a description of the day of the Lord. And what a horrifying day of judgment it is. A man meets a lion in the road, and he runs away from the lion. And then he meets a bear, and he runs away from the bear. And he runs to his home, and a snake bites him when he gets home. That guy couldn't seem to catch a break, but that guy was under the judgment of God in Amos 5. He was being punished. So what's the deal with Paul? The Lord said he wanted Paul to go to Rome, but man, oh man, the Lord keeps throwing obstacle after obstacle at Paul to make it look like it's the opposite of that. Is Paul under God's judgment? And all the natives of the island seem to think so. Even though Paul's escaped the sea, the natives think, well, justice is out to get you, Paul. You need to die for that. They take it as a sign of judgment. He must have done something truly bad. He must have murdered somebody. Now, actually, we know from history that Paul really has murdered people in the past. Acts 26 and verse 10, he indicated that uh, whenever Christians were on trial for their faith, he cast his vote against them to put them to death. Uh, now, when Jesus appeared to Ananias and told him to convert Saul, he said, I'm going to show this man just how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And part of the reason Paul's suffering may have had something to do with his past sins. But Jesus said it's going to be for my name's sake. Paul suffers a lot for Christ. And so the fact that Paul is able to suffer for Christ is not punishment for sins, but rather it's a sign of grace that God allows him to do that. But the assumption of these natives that Paul's just being punished for sin, well, that's incorrect. Paul just shakes the serpent off and throws it into the fire. And everybody sits around and they're waiting. Is he going to swell up? Is he going to drop dead? That doesn't happen. And then they start thinking, well, and then they go to the opposite extreme. Instead of thinking he's a murderer, they start to think he's a god of some kind. That's similar to the mistake they made at Lystra in Acts chapter 14, in verses 11 through 18. They heal a man who's been lame for a long time at Lystra, and then the inhabitants of Lystra say, Oh, the gods have become men and have come down to us in human form. And they call Paul Hermes, and Barnabas is Zeus. And they begin trying to sacrifice to them and worship them. But there's also something else, too. Um, the longer ending of Mark, Mark 16 and verse 18, makes reference to this idea of the disciples. And it really appears a couple times in this chapter, the ideas from this segment. Jesus says in Mark 16, in verses 17 and 18, that these signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. And then they will lay... And they will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. All right, well, there you go. Paul, uh, well, the serpent tries to pick him up, but it's the same thing, really. The serpent bites onto his hand, but it does not harm him. Uh, now, today, of course, there's a lot of media sensation about people who claim to be uh, endowed with special powers, and they go out and they handle snakes, and then they get bitten and die. Well, that's a sign that God is not with them. That happens. But Paul, well, God is with him, and that's the, the evidence here is what is evidenced in this story, that the Lord is on his side, watching out for him, defending him, so that this deadly snake does not harm him. But another sign from Mark is that they will lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. And in verses 7 through 10, that's what happens. In the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us courteously three days. And it happened that the father of Publius was lying in bed, afflicted with recurrent fever and dysentery. And Paul went in to see him, and after he had prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. And after this had happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and getting cured. They also honored us with many marks of respect, and when we were setting sail, they supplied us with all we needed. So now we have a healing on this island for the father of Publius, the leading man of the island was named Publius. He welcomes the people. He shows them hospitality for several days. 
And his father, well, his father has fever. His father has dysentery. If you're playing Oregon Trail, that's like a death sentence of sorts. And this isn't a happy situation he's in. But Paul, like Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law, Paul goes and heals Publius' father. He goes in, lays hands on him, he prays, and he is healed. Laying hands on the sick to heal them. You'll remember that was mentioned in Mark 16, 18 as well. And of course this leads to an, uh, a boom of healings, of miracles. Many people on the island come to him in order to have their diseases cured. Again, reminding us of Jesus' work in the Gospels. The mass healings of Jesus and Peter's work. It reminds us of Peter's work in Jerusalem. Where all the people wanted to just fall, have his shadow fall on them so that they might heal, be healed. It reminds us of Ephesus, whenever Paul was touching handkerchiefs, and they would take those handkerchiefs, and they would carry them to the sick, and the sick would touch those handkerchiefs and be healed. That's the kind of thing that's going on all again. God has not stopped working through Paul. He is with them even at Malta, even after shipwreck and snake bite, even in imprisonment. Paul does, And what's amazing about this is Paul performs all these miracles. He's still a prisoner of the Romans. He's still under their custody. He's not allowed to just wander off on his own. He's one of their prisoners. And as this Roman prisoner, who's supposed to be ashamed, is leaving this island, the Maltans honor them with marks of respect. They supply them as they set sail again. You know, they have this practice in India of decorating, uh, visiting teachers with garlands and shawls and, of course, embarrassing us in the process. Mark and I have both been through that. Um, but you know, I mean, it's similar to what you see in Acts 28, verse 10. These marks of respect are indicated as a way of kindness, a way of saying thanks. You know, is Paul, Paul doesn't refuse them. But what Paul does is, well, he heals their sick, and there's no, and surely, as he has done everywhere else, the true credit belongs to God. He is not some mere, well, he is not someone who is special in and of himself. Rather, he is a vessel for the Lord for his will in those instances. Now, we come to Rome. Well, we've got to get the last leg of the journey first in verses 11 through 15. At the end of three months, we set sail on an Alexandrian ship which had wintered on the island, which had the twin brothers for its figurehead. After we put in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. From there, we sailed around and arrived at Regium. And a day later, a south wind sprang up. And on the second day, we came to Puteoli. There we found some brethren and were invited to stay with them for seven days. Thus we came to Rome. And the brethren, when they heard about us, came from there as far as the market of Apius and three inns to meet us. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Alright, so back to the map. We can see this. Uh, that's Malta. They set sail to Syracuse. They're actually, uh, they spend three months on Malta because, well... They've got to spend the winter there. It's not safe to travel on the sea during the winter, as they've just learned the hard way. Um, you know, they didn't want to. They didn't want to winter in Fairhaven, so they wind up wintering in Malta without a ship. They have to get another ship, an Alexandrian ship, that happened to also be wintering there. Um, and like the previous Alexandrian ship, this was probably one that was carrying grain supplies to Italy. They stopped in Syracuse for a few days. Syracuse here, as you can see, is off the coast of the island of Sicily. Uh, it's not to be confused with another city in New York called Syracuse. I googled Syracuse and that was the first thing that came up. Um, it sailed, from there they sailed to Regium. And if, Regia, if Italy is a boot, then Regium is the toe of that boot. Uh, so there they've made it to Italy, finally. And then, from there, a south wind, a favorable wind, which blows from the south to the north, allows them to sail all the way to Puteoli, or Puzzioli, as it's called today. Um, no, Pozzuoli. The city of uh, Pozzuoli is a emporium for grain sale. It was the place where the Alexandrian grain ships would go to to deposit their grain, to buy and sell and train. That trade. That was the place where you did that business. Uh, now, What's interesting is in verse 14, Paul's allowed to visit with his brethren. They find some brethren in this town and they stay there for seven days. The Romans are giving Paul a lot of latitude for someone who's supposed to be a prisoner. It's similar to what we saw in 27 and verse 3, that the centurion Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. Here, the brethren are able to help Paul. 
Now, Puteoli is actually 170 miles away from Rome. Uh, this map makes it look like it's really close together. They have to travel by the highway of what is known as the Apian Way, um, and two places on the way, the Three Taverns and the Forum Api, or the Market of Apius. Um, and for reference, 170 miles between these two places, that's more than, that's actually double the distance between Nazareth and Jerusalem. You think about that, and the Gospels devote so much space to Jesus traveling half that distance from Nazareth to Jerusalem, from, from Galilee to Jerusalem. And here it just, it's told, thus we came to Rome, in verse 14. Uh, you know, and so, you know, not all the information is given in details. The brethren uh, appear, uh, the brethren appear to have com accompanied Paul on this journey, actually. They came to meet Paul, the Market of Apius, and the three taverns, both of which were on the way to Rome, uh, Market of Apius. For reference, this Market of Apius is about 43 miles to the, southwest, to the southeast of Rome, and three taverns is about 31 miles. Finally, in verse 16, they enter Rome. And we have a hearing before the Jews. Finally. When we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. After three days, Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews. And when they came together, he began saying to them, Brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they were willing to release me because there was no ground for putting me to death. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any accusation against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. They said to him, We have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren come here and reported or spoken anything bad about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for concerning this sect it is known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. Once again, we see a couple things. First of all, Paul's circumstances continue to be incredibly lenient. He is allowed to stay by himself. Uh, not in the Roman prisons where conditions are horrible, but rather apparently in a house, under house arrest. The only stipulation is he actually has to have a Roman soldier there standing guard with him. But other than that, Paul is free to move about uh, in his home. He's not... He's not given the horrible conditions and treatment that some of the Roman prisoners were notorious for getting in that day and time. And, of course, this environment would have been conducive for when Paul wrote many of his prison epistles. Um, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon were probably all written from this Roman prison. Um, and some people think that Paul wrote some of these letters when he was for that, during that two-year stay in Caesarea. And while that's possible, Philippians at least seems to assume that Paul is staying in, uh, in Rome under the watch of the Praetorian Guard. After three days in Rome, Paul himself calls the Jews together to explain why he's there. He hasn't done anything wrong, but he was arrested at Jerusalem and given to the Romans. And of course, we've rehashed this story several times already. That They accused him of bringing a Gentile into the temple. He didn't really do that. And uh, after hearing, after hearing, dissolved into chaos, and them, eventually them wanting to bring him to a hearing so that they could ambush and kill him, the Romans wanted to release Paul, but they had no grounds, well, since they had no grounds for executing him. But the Jews weren't so keen on that idea. They wanted to have their trial so that they could kill Paul on the way to it. And so Paul says in verse 19 that he was forced to appeal to Caesar. Although he's quick to add he has no accusation against his nation. In fact, why is Paul here? He says, I'm here. I'm wearing this chain for the hope of Israel. Paul says, I care about the stuff you care about the same goal you do. I care about the hope of Israel. That's why I'm in this chain. The hope of Israel, of course, is ultimately realized through Jesus Christ. And Israel, of course, is not just ethnic Jews, but rather the people of God as a whole, both Jews and Gentiles. Spiritual Israel. But what's remarkable to me is the Jewish response here. That they haven't gotten a single letter from Judea. And that none of the accusers have actually showed up to, stand, to make their accusation against Paul. For all of their fervency in trying to accuse Paul, for all of their fervency in trying to condemn Paul, 
Not a single Jew who accused him in Jerusalem has actually bothered to write to Rome, much less show up for the proceedings. Now, maybe they tried to write and the letter got lost in a shipwreck. I don't know. No one bothers... To, I mean, but seriously though, you can't be bothered to show up at the trial? Paul made, pointed out this is a problem earlier when he was standing trial before Felix in chapter 24 and verse 19. He says... Uh, in verses 18 and 19, that there were some Jews from Asia who ought to have been present before you and to make accusation if they should have anything against me. In other words, where are, the, where, where are these accusations coming from? First one group accuses me, now another group accuses me. Which is it? Make up your minds. What is the accusation? Who are the accusers for that matter? They've got nothing against Paul, they just don't like him. That's what the real issue is. Well, you never see any, anybody treated like that today, do you? Hmm. These Roman Jews, they don't know anything about Paul personally. They do know about the sect he's a part of, or at least they've heard about it, and they know it's spoken of everywhere, spoken against everywhere. So you know what these guys do? They dismiss Paul out of hand? No, actually. They want to hear what his views are. They actually want to assess it for themselves. It's kind of like, you kind of get a little bit of hope here. Maybe these guys will be like the Bereans, noble-minded, willing to search the scriptures and see whether this thing is in fact so, whether it is true. Well, the actual hearing isn't as amazing. They set a day for Paul. They came to him at his lodging in large numbers. He was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. Some were being persuaded by the things spoken. That's good. Others would not believe. And when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word through the Holy Spirit. One parting word. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers, saying, Go to this people and say you will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and return, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will also listen. This is the typical response he gets everywhere else in Acts. Paul's sermon at Rome is not recorded in great detail. We're not given what he preached here. We are told that he gets a large audience and testifies to them concerning the kingdom of God. He uses the law and the Moses and the, the law of Moses and the prophets to persuade them concerning Jesus. And so, in that sense. Paul's mission to Rome is a success. He testifies to God and to the kingdom of God at Rome. He gets an audience. From morning until evening, he has the attention of these people. And as we've seen everywhere else in Acts, some are persuaded, some are not. Does the truth persuade everybody? No. Not everybody is always persuaded by the truth, no matter how eloquently it is given, no matter how powerfully it is preached, and I think you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody who preaches as effectively as Paul did. And as they're departing, Paul gets the last word. This is exactly what the Holy Spirit said, guys. He quotes from Isaiah 6, in verses 9 and 10. A text where the prophet tells people, Don't listen to this. Don't look at this. Don't understand this. Obviously, he's being sarcastic. Go on. You're not going to listen to this message anyway, so you might as well just ignore it. You don't... I have nothing more to say to you. People's hearts are hardened by the message itself. They may profess to be open-minded. They may give off that air of being open to things and discussing them, but just as Moses' message hardened the heart of Pharaoh, Isaiah's message hardened the heart of his fellow Israelites, well, the message of the cross hardens the hearts of some who are inclined to reject it in order to prevent them from repenting, in order to prevent them from being healed. But wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. I, I thought that God desired all to come to a knowledge of the truth. That He desired all to come to repentance. What about 2 Peter 3? What about 1 Timothy 2? It's not that God isn't interested in repentance. It's that God will allow people to pursue the self-destructive course to their own self-interests. 
God will even give you what you want. He'll even facilitate you in what you want. The world says, oh, well, you know, God doesn't know what he's talking about. Or, well, there is no God. Okay, you want to live in that world? God will let you live in that world. But be careful what you ask for. Because the truth is that a world without God is a terrifying world. A world where you don't get his blessings. A world where you don't get his cleansing, his food, his drink, the air that he provides you, that you breathe in and out of your lungs. It doesn't come from natural forces alone. It comes from the Lord, ultimately. So in essence, only those who want to be right with God in the first place will be driven to repentance. You know what these Jews are doing? They're acting just like their ancestors from Isaiah's day. And for... Jesus, of course, quotes this passage as well when he explains why he speaks in parables. Then he says something else. This is just as relevant today. There are people who profess to be religious, who profess to be devoted to what the Lord wants, who claim they really do submit to the Lord's authority. But when push comes to shove, and their sacred cows are getting slaughtered, and their toes are getting stepped on, what happens? I'm going to do things my way. They don't listen to the message and they will not turn and be healed. May God help that never may God help it us all. That never happens here. May God help us all. In verses 30 and 31 He stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered and Paul's in Rome for two full years. This would have been from 58 to 60 AD. He's still able to have guests, which is kind of nice. He's able to preach the kingdom of God. He's able to talk about the Lord Jesus with openness. And as he says later on in Philippians, his circumstances turn out for the greater progress of the gospel. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1 in verses 12 through 14, but I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. It wasn't just that Paul got to speak it, it's that others also were motivated to stand up and speak it as well. Because they saw Paul's courage. Because they saw him in prison, standing before the Roman guards, and speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what he is able to do in Rome. Preach the kingdom of God and teach concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness, unhindered. And that's the end of the book of Acts. Oh, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. You know, you're probably wondering the same thing that I am. What about Paul's trial? I mean, that's the whole reason he's going to Rome, right? I mean, they've got him on trial before Caesar and everything else. Now, the, And you know, the book of Acts, I mean, if it doesn't, it seems to me that it ends rather abruptly. You know, we spend all this time, really from chapter 21 onwards, arguably chapter 19 onwards, talking about how Paul would get to Rome and stand trial, and we finally get there, what happens? No trials mentioned at all. The trial before the Romans is not in Acts 28. We never read about his defense before Nero. We never read about the speech he gave to that man. Why? Now the most common explanation, and one that I've given myself, is that when Luke wrote the book, well, it hasn't happened yet. I mean, and that makes sense. He can't write what happens next if it hasn't actually happened yet. In fact, some take that further and speculate that Luke Acts is Luke and Acts together are a legal brief that Luke is help, using to help Paul prepare for his hearing. And that's possible. I wouldn't throw that out. It's hard to prove. You know, and you've got to be careful when you read these reconstructions of how biblical books came to be. There's a problem with that, though with thinking that the trial didn't happen when Luke wrote it, Luke knows how long Paul's in Rome. He knows how long that period of time lasts, implicitly. And he doesn't say the words, Paul was acquitted. But he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters, was welcoming all who came to him. He stayed two full years there, implies that at the end of two years he wasn't staying there anymore. So, it seems to presuppose that Paul was in fact acquitted. 
So when Luke wrote Acts, as we have it, his trial probably was over. So why not tell us about the trial? Why not satisfy our curiosity? And let me ask you this, why not satisfy our curiosity about so many other things in the Bible? You know, we'd love to hear the whole story, wouldn't we? If you know anything about Paul, and what happened to him after the book of Acts, well, I mean, he was eventually acquitted, as noted. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 3 indicates that at some point he returned to Ephesus. So, uh, what happened there, this idea that well, whenever Paul said in his speech in Acts 20 that you would not see my face again, turns out they did see his face again. Paul couldn't see that far into the future. Titus indicates that at some point he visited Crete as well, since he, left, he had to go to Crete to leave Titus in Crete at some point, according to Titus 1 and verse 5. Um, Titus 3 and verse 12 indicates he also went to Nicopolis. He probably made it to Spain. We know from reading the book of Romans that he wanted to go to Spain, and not in the Bible, but in, written in the first century, was the book of 1 Clement, which indicates that Paul did, in fact, go to Spain and spent a good deal of time preaching there. Eventually, 2 Timothy would indicate that he was re-arrested by the Romans, and history tells us that he was killed in AD 67 in wake of Nero's persecution. This would have been about nine years after he arrived at Rome in Acts 28. So what wound up resulting in Paul's death is not what we read about in the book of Acts. So what do we do with all that? What's the point of it all? Why not tell us what happened in the book of Acts? I mean, you can figure out that information from reading other stuff. But Acts is not a biography of Paul. And Acts is not an all-inclusive, exhaustive history of the early church either. In fact, if Acts was supposed to be an exhaustive history of early churches, you know, it doesn't tell us anything about how churches came to be in Egypt. It doesn't tell us anything about the, the, the supposed movement of churches to Illyricum or even to India in some places, which happened, in this, uh, at least according to tradition, in the first century. It doesn't tell us much about the growth of churches in Jerusalem either. Because Acts is not designed to satisfy all of our curiosities. The main point of Acts, and we've, I've said it throughout the series, there's this recurring theme of growth coming throughout the book. Chapter 6 and verse 7, the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of disciples continued to increase in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Chapter 9 and verse 31, the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up. And going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. In chapter 12 and verse 24, the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. In chapter 16, in verse 5, the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. In chapter 19 and verse 20, the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. In chapter 28 and verse 31, Paul was preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. What is the book of Acts really about? Some, Bi some Bible headings listed as Acts of the Apostles. But it's really more like Acts of the Spirit. If the Gospel of Luke is referred to in Acts 1 as all that Jesus began to do and teach, well then Acts is all that Jesus continued to do and teach through his workers, through his disciples. But the abrupt ending is more than that. It's a reminder to us it's a reminder to us that the true work of growth that's described throughout all those verses in Acts isn't actually finished. The Lord's work is not done. Paul's work is not done just because he made it to Rome. The work of Christ is not done. The Gospel of Luke was what Jesus began. That's volume one. The book of Acts is what Jesus continued to do. That's volume two. Where's volume three? Where's Acts 29? I would submit that it's, well, our very lives are supposed to be that. And just as Jesus continued to act and teach through the apostles, he should continue to act and teach through us, his people today. Just as the Spirit moved the apostles to preach the word and defend the faith, also the Spirit should move us to preach the word and defend the faith even today. Just as they bore witness to Christ's resurrection and lordship, so should we. Just as they taught the kingdom of God openly, unhindered, so should we.
that is what it is about. The book of Acts is not just a book to satisfy our historical curiosity, although it's, you know, it's a goldmine for people who really like history. But it's something else too. Something greater than that. It's a picture of what we need to be. Take out your songbooks. Conclude the lesson this morning. Book of Acts is, it's, I mean, it's it's pattern for our behavior and for who we are supposed to be. It's one of the most indispensable books in the Bible, in the New Testament, especially, because you have the Gospels, which tell you about who Jesus was. And you have all these letters Paul and the disciples wrote to the churches, explaining who they needed to be. But where did all that come from? What's the connecting action between those two things? Acts shows us how they transformed themselves, how the message of the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ transformed people who were following dead idols and failed systems, how it transformed them so that they would turn to follow the living God. How it transformed a guy like Paul, who once stood against it, to standing for it and being ready to give his life up for it. It's a book about how one not only becomes a Christian, but how one lives as a Christian and continues making other Christians as well. And so if we're going to ask ourselves anything this morning, we should be to ask how well are we conformed to what Acts is talking about? Are we, for instance, have we been baptized into Christ like everybody in the book of Acts is? And secondly... Are we proclaiming the kingdom of God like every disciple of Jesus, every faithful disciple is doing? With our speech, with our actions, do we solemnly testify by who we are and what we say and what we do to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Now, if there's anyone here this morning who needs to make their life right, who needs to conform their lives to the Lord, who needs to enter the kingdom of God or possibly to re-enter it if they have left it, Whatever your need may be, now is an appropriate time and place as any to let it be known. While together we stand and we sing the song selected.